All right. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Uh, this is the last event of 2020 in our series from Manuscript to Marketplace, brought to you by the Authors Guild Foundation, which is the charitable and educational arm of the Authors Guild. Uh, the series is funded in part by the New York State Council on the Arts, so we thank them and all our supporters. Uh, this series, from Manuscript to Marketplace, focuses on how a book was published and marketed, including uh, the agenting process, editing, publicity, uh, everything from start to finish. So we're gonna hear from the author uh, of Mexican Gothic, Sylvia Moreno Garcia, and uh, members from the marketing team at Del Rey and her agent. Um, they're gonna tell us what it was like to publish this book and in particular, uh, given how the pandemic has affected things, uh, canceling book events, changing things, virtual marketing and all that. So now it's my pleasure to introduce Sylvia Moreno Garcia. She's the author of speculative fiction and sci-fi works, including Gods of Jade and Shadow, Signal to Noise, Certain Dark Things, The Beautiful Ones, and Prime Meridian. And she's edited several anthologies, including the World Fantasy Award-winning She Walks in Shadows. We have Julie Lung, who by day is the marketing director at Random House's sci-fi and fantasy imprint Del Rey. And by night, she writes children's books, including the upcoming The Fearless Flights of Hazel Yang Lee. Uh, Ashley Heaton is a marketer at Del Rey who loves getting books into the hands of readers. She approaches each title with a creative eye to tell its unique story. And, and Eddie Schneider is the VP of Jabberwocky Literary Agency. He represents best-selling and criti critically acclaimed authors of sci-fi and fantasy, YA and middle grade fiction and nonfiction, and more. Uh, so Sylvia and all, we all wanna hear about the book, of course, and we also wanna hear what it's been like to publish during the pandemic, what has made Mexican Gothic so successful, besides its brilliance, of course. Uh, and congratulations on the uh, award you recently received, Goodreads Choice for Best Horror, right? And uh, any advice you might have um, for authors, uh, authors who are maybe finishing a manuscript right now, querying, or maybe have a release date coming up and are wondering about how marketing is going. So with that, I'll turn things over to you. And uh, in a bit, we'll, we'll have time for Q&A from the audience. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me and my team, my marketing team and my agent. Uh, we're going to be talking about Mexican Gothic today, but this team also worked on my previous novel, Gods of Jade and Shadow. So if during the Q&A, you also want to ask a little bit more about that, we can. And we are working on my next novel, Velvet Was the Night, um, right now. So we can also talk about future works and that kind of stuff. So we've been, we've been together for a while. So uh, it's been a bit of a journey. I'll tell you a little bit about Mexican Gothic first, and then we'll move on and see how this progresses. So Mexican Gothic is my second book with Del Rey and my sixth novel. What happened was that a few years ago, um, Eddie and I sold Gods of Jade and Shadow to Trisha over at Del Rey. She's my editor. And it was a two book deal. So this meant that we sold Gods of Jade and Shadow, which was already complete, and she bought another book to be written later on. And while we were doing the negotiations of the contract, we talked about what that second book might be. I said, I don't write sequels, I don't do series, and I change genres with every book. So this is what you're gonna be looking at with me. So my next book is going to be either a sci-fi novel or a Gothic novel. Trisha seemed to be okay with that. So I ended up going with the Gothic angle because I had wanted to do a Gothic novel for a really long time now. And um, I started, at first I had a different idea for a Gothic novel, something that I've been thinking about for 15 years, but I wasn't quite ready yet. So maybe in another five, maybe, maybe at 20 or 25, I'll be finally ready to write that one. But what I did then since that, first idea that I wanted to work on didn't quite work is I went and I opened my idea folder and I do literally have a folder that says idea on it. And it's where I put everything that I think about that might be useful. And um, some of it is very elaborate and some of it's very simple. And I pulled several ideas from there. One was a dream that I'd had, which directly inspired the mycology element of the book. And another idea that I had at the time had been that uh, when I was younger, I visited the English cemetery at Real del Monte. And it's called the English cemetery because it's this town high in the mountains of Hidalgo where a bunch of British miners were mining during the 1800s and they built their own little British town there and they had their own cemetery. And 
I went there and it was like being transported to a different location. It felt like I was in a black and white movie and Christopher Lee was going to show up as a vampire from behind a tombstone. So with this and other ideas in hand, I started writing. I started working on it. And then I had a meeting with Trisha at one point. It was a casual meeting. Um, and rather than writing a proposal, I just basically chatted with her. And I said, this is what I'm thinking. This is what I'm working on right now. And I had already told Eddie I'm working on something. And I said, it's this book. It's, uh, it's called right now Mexican Gothic. And uh, this is what I want to do. And I, and I came up with a line that later on we used during marketing meetings, which was, it's a book for the uh, trashy but classy reader. <laughs> yes. And what I mean with that is not that people are trash, like, you know, uh, the Muppet that's in the trash. No. Um, what I mean is that horror fiction um, in general, but also gothic, which is kind of this hybrid genre that sometimes is more on the romance pole and sometimes is more on the horror uh, pole, are often considered to be trash, horror specifically. Um, I've been asked many times, why do you write horror? Why do you like horror? And people seem a little bit appalled. They think it's kind of like lowbrow or a little bit disgusting. Uh, so people don't really seem to like it, uh, uh, think much, very much of it. At the same time, I remembered that when I was uh, growing up and I was a teenager, um, girls passed around books such as Flowers in the Attic, um, you know, like it was uh, like it was a drug, you know, everybody wanted to read that. And I love black and white movies, old horror movies, especially in a gothic vein, especially those Vincent Price and Christopher Lee sort of um, movies that had that kind of very thick atmosphere. I love that stuff. And so I thought, well, I mean, I, I love gothic as a genre, as a form, but I also love its aesthetics. Um, I think you can do a lot of smart things with it. I'm going to do it. So I'm going to make a book that is going to pull out all those things that you really loved, all the trashy stuff that you really loved when you were reading it, all the castles on the moonlight and the mist and the people hiding behind the shadows. Um, but at the same, but it's going to be a classy book because it's going to be a book that you're not afraid to hold in the subway while you're reading it. And of course, this was pre-COVID. So nowadays we might say that we would not be ashamed to post it on Instagram rather than uh, put a brown paper bag in front of it in the subway. But it's just that feeling that it would be something that you would, you would be happy to talk about and to share with others and you would really enjoy. It wouldn't be a shameful experience. And, and so, um, and then I could layer all these other things that I was concerned about, like eugenics, um, like women in turn of the century in 1950s Mexico, all that kind of stuff. But I thought this is going to be, yeah, it's going to have those elements that we tend to consider trashy because it's horror. I can't, you know, make it not horror. And we tend to think of it like that, but it's going to be cool enough that you're not going to be afraid to be proud of it as I and I think it worked. <laughs> I think we did it. Um, but that's how the book kind of originated and how we started to talk about positioning it early on. So I don't know who wants to take it up right now. I don't know if Eddie wants to talk a little bit about um, maybe what it's been like agenting somebody like me who switches around quite a bit. And then maybe we can talk a little bit more about the marketing because I know I'm a difficult client. Um, aside from the fact that I switch genres around, I want to know everything that is going on at all times. <laughs> Well, okay. So, hey, I'm Eddie. Um, and sh if we're shifting over to me first, um, I don't, th I'm not, well, I am being paid to say this, but I'm not being, not, not, or I'm not being paid to say this. Um, and Sylvie's not a difficult client. Um, and it can often be a lot easier if somebody wants to know what's going on with every step of the way. Um, it, yeah, it's, th there are fewer surprises for one, but uh, Okay, so um, jumping around from genre to genre can be challenging. Um, not as much, so so for me as, as like a human being and as a reader and stuff, I'm very content like uh, jumping around a lot um, with um, regard to like 
building the grand arc of a publishing career or whatever um, for a client that becomes a little bit more challenging because a lot of times it's easier to, you know, if, if, if you've got like uh, M is for murder, R is for robbery, um, and you just keep, keep doing a lot of the same sort of thing, you know, you have a tried and true audience and you can, you can build that at, um, over the course of, uh, you know, years. Um, but at the same time, it also, like, there's an opportunity. Um, me, I see it as, as there being an opportunity with, with being able to look at everything fresh and um, come up with ideas in terms of, like, pitching. From, from my end of things, since I'm, you know, the agent more than, like, doing the marketing publicity um i'm looking at you know like when it when a contract is up um so for example um gods of jade and shadow was uh so sylvia had had um her first two books well not first two books um okay so her second and third novels um if I've got that timeline even right, but okay. So Certain Dark Things and The Beautiful Ones, which um, had initially published with um, Thomas Dunn Books and Macmillan. And that contract was up. And at that time, Sylvia's editor over there had, had left um, and is now working as an agent herself. And we were um, trying to figure out what to do. So the fact that Sylvia writes a lot of different things um, worked to her advantage kind of here because it wasn't like, you know, book three of a trilogy or something where we were trying to find a new publisher for the, who would want to pick up the, a series part way or a trilogy part way or whatever. It was, okay, we have this cool new book by this author who's done all this other cool stuff and they're all one-offs and the people who like this are going to like that. Um, and so it wasn't, so because of that, it was, it was relatively easy to, um, to go and pitch uh, to a whole bunch of different editors. And then um, Trisha came in uh, with the greatest enthusiasm and the greatest, you know, wanted to be the person to publish Sylvia. And that has uh, continued to be the case ever since um, uh, across, across multiple books now. Um, there are, well, I don't know what has or hasn't been announced, but there's, there's more, more to come. Yeah, and honestly, just weighing in from the marketing side, Sylvia, I feel like your involvement has made this book what it is. I, I mean, I don't know if um, Trisha shared the story. I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about how even like the um, detail of the flowers in her hand and the cover and sort of how it signifies like that's from your research, if I'm not mistaken, right? Um, yes, the the flowers that she is holding are sempasuchil, um, you know, type of marigold, which is used in Mexico, especially in the fall for the Day of the Dead altars. And uh, originally she was holding a key and I asked that it be changed. We talked about what she should be holding and we asked, I asked about um, the, these flowers specifically and with um, and with Gods of Jade and Shadow, the original color palette that they had was too dark. So I actually sent over pictures of what, I think it was Mexican pottery and uh, different how the color, showing how the color palette um, would look like if it was different and showing what, you know, Mexican pink looks like. It's very bright and, and that kind of, of, of stuff. Um, and I think also with this, cover we talked about skin tones with this color definitely um so i looked at it and it was it was too pale so we said uh she needs to be darker her hair needs to be darker i provided i think uh visual samples also of what that should look like and i have provided visual samples for every cover that i do i normally send um my own kind of mini brief with uh, visual examples and things like that and i talk about um why something should be the way it is. So the green that you're seeing here um, is accurate because there was a time period in the Victorian era when they started producing these very bright green pigments, which are lovely, but they're deadly, they, they are poisonous. And so there are certain dresses and wallpapers that um, if you touch, they will make you sick. So this bright green is kind of 
a throwback to that Victorian uh, sort of look. Um, but yeah, no, and we kind of had originally one of the things we talked about was whether we would do um, kind of like a reproduction of the 1960s Gothic revival covers, which have a woman running away from, from a house, but we went for this more modern take. Um, we are doing for the paperback edition, we're doing a uh, kind of like a fake step back cover. So if you remember Flowers in the Attic, I sent materials to Trisha and we talked about that, about what covers were like in, in that time period. And, and there was a step back where it had a cutout. They often had cutouts in Flowers in the Attic. So there was the picture that you saw um, at the bookstore, but then you opened it and there was a full double page um, color illustration and it kind of defined flowers in the attic specifically, but you also saw those step backs, especially in romances. They're not so common nowadays because it was much more expensive to do that kind of print cover work and they fell out of vogue. So for the paperback, we talked about what we could do for it. And one of the things we um, ended up discussing was um, a fake uh, step back that will be when you open it. And when we were discussing that and Trisha was asking, well, what would it look like? Some of the things that I sent visually were examples of, um, I think 1970s, a mixture of both uh, period book covers. So book covers from the Gothic area of that time and also movie posters. So some Italian movie po horror movie posters that had a lot of saturated color um, in that. So yeah, I, I'm often, I like being involved in that sense and, uh, and talking with people about things like typography and all that kind of stuff. It's, I actually really enjoy it. I know some people don't really like to be involved at that level. I do actually like to talk about fonts and, and that kind of stuff. And, I, and I've had stu I have studied that in my like regular day job kind of thing. So it's my day job bleeding into uh, my kind of author work. And it makes you such a great partner to work with. I mean, one of the, speaking from the marketing side of things, one of your early ideas was the paper dolls, which we then actually did in the pandemic world. We were able to make it work and make it a printable so yeah. people could have an activity at home. Um, and people are like, oh, that's a great idea. Where'd you come up with that? And I was like, that's all Sylvia. So that was Sylvia's idea. We worked with an artist and we made it happen, but um, it's just so authentic to the story and you have such a great command and well of knowledge that we're always able to go back to you for. Um, so it's been really great to partner with you um, and it's made our jobs easier for sure um, because you have you know all this great uh, material to work with and of course you write beautiful books uh, which makes it definitely easier. But. Also it's just so fun to go through the book and just highlight all the fashion. <laughs> I remember yes. my mom and I was just like yeah, this outfit and this outfit and this outfit we'll pick our favorite and get it illustrated um, but yeah I mean to that point too I, I do think that the best kinds of partnerships do involve authors on an intimate level. And we do not mind when you ask us any questions, because I do think it helps inform our strategy, informs where you're thinking. And you come from such a wealth of expertise about the subject matter. We used your essays. We used sort of all your playlists that you kind of came up with. And that was extra material that as marketers, we're able to sort of help build the world. I like to think of marketing as like, we're like an author's hype person. Like, you know, we've got the book, we've got the author. We're the ones like, rolling out ahead and like getting it ready, like getting people excited and pumped. And I have to say when that cover first came like to our inboxes, I think everyone collectively screamed. Like it was so perfect for the manuscript, I think. And so much of, um, you know, so much has to be communicated with that tiny little square, especially these days when shopping is just scrolling on the internet and look like having something actually pop out from the sea of other options that people could be looking at. Um, matters a lot. And I think, you know, between the work that you and Trisha did to sort of make sure that every piece of it m made it perfect, kind of made our jobs a lot easier to not have to sell a book that whose cover is just going to be lost. Um, so kudos on all that work. Yeah, and kind of the view from 30,000 feet on this too is um, that uh, just going in, we were able to um, really be able to like, like, like we were able to discuss things with Trisha and we've been able to discuss things with Delray and like go in as collaborators and discuss the, you know, discuss the, like, like go back and forth on, on particular aspects of the cover. Like um, Sylvia was talking about the Marigolds um, and being able to do that, I think has um, just opened up a lot um, and 
you know, really, really helped things pop the way that they have. Yeah, I think there was also, um, well, there was a lot of adapting this year to circumstances. So with the paper dolls that were designed originally, when we were talking about the paper dolls, we were thinking that we would print them out and actually mail them out to um, like yeah. book reviewers and that that kind of work. And then when COVID happened, we couldn't be doing the kind of printing and mail outs that we had been um, kind of considering before. We couldn't like special gift wrap them in green because at one point we said, we're gonna wrap them in like green paper that's gonna match the cover. We talked about these ideas and we'll put the dolls in there. And then that was impossible. So we instead kind of adapted and um, the the final, it's a fine, it's a PDF printable and it tells you, you know, you cut it, you can you know, cut it out and do it and do it at home for fun, which which worked out. But there was a lot of um, little adaptations going on as as we were moving because we didn't know what was what was going to happen. And I was actually um, I was in California when I when COVID um, kind of the borders closed for Canada on it was March 15, and I was in a it was in a conference over there. I was promoting uh, Untamed Shore, which is a crime novel that came out from a small press um, before COVID kind of struck. And I had paid for all of this myself because it was a small press and I've never gone on tour. So I was making my own mini tour and I was gonna speak at a library and we were having all these events. And every day that would pass, uh, something would show up in the news and I would be like, oh, oh, you know, because I'm, I was going to be there for two weeks in, in California and then, oh, 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 oh. And then until on March 14, I remember I, um, I said, I'm going to change my flight because the conference was supposed to start Thursday um, evening. Well, really Friday, Thursday, I think we were going to have cocktails and Friday was going to be the real conference. And I, and I said, I uh, called my family and I said, I'm coming back home early. I'm going to fly. I don't feel safe. Things are very strange. And um, and then the next morning, uh, the border uh, uh, announcement closure was, was announced. So I was in the, you know, like a plane uh, getting back into Canada, like one of the last people, I guess, getting in. Um, and it was very stressful on a number on a number of fronts. And on one side, I was getting emails from my job saying the university is closed. Uh, don't come, <laughs> don't come to work uh, because we're closed down. On the other hand, I was just wondering, am I going to be able to make it under the wire back into Canada? And then I was thinking, oh, we have a book this summer. Um, and it was the first time that I was going to fly into for an event in New York. Um, actually this summer to promote Mexican Gothic. And so I was very excited about that. And all of a sudden, well, that was out the window. That was going to be kind of like the big, the big one, the big event that I was going to go to. Now I couldn't, and we didn't even know what was going to happen. So it was very strange and stressful. And then we kind of just, this kind of adapting started to happen. Things like Paper dolls cannot be printed because nobody can go into the office. It can't be wrapped in green paper because nobody can wrap it in wheel in green paper. Um, and and other things came down the line. And, and so we had to kind of change streams and do some things that we wouldn't have done uh, before, uh, really kind of quickly. <laughs> You're giving me flashbacks, Sylvia, of this terrible time in March. Yeah. But I I think you hit the nail on the head. Like so, so much of our traditional um, channels, the way we would have promoted these special mailers to independent booksellers, the events. I think the events piece in particular for our genre, the science fiction fantasy horror genre, we relied so much on conventions. We remember we went to Emerald City Comic Con together. We actually like stood two feet away from one another. Um, those weren't options on the table. And it's been a particularly difficult year, especially if you don't necessarily have that built-in platform to go ahead and like bring the audience to you. So we've had to be really creative. And I think, you know, our pivots really were in thinking like, you know, the audience is still there. They still want to read. They still, if anything, books are one of the few not like, you know, non-screen activities you could be doing during pandemic. There's still this opportunity, but the channels in which people are receiving their news about books has changed. And so a lot of that effort that we would have devoted over to like sending authors to signings, sending authors to conventions, we immediately pivoted over to digital options, whether it was sort of panels such as this, 
or um, we would do a lot more influencer outreach. So, you know, influencers still wanting to take pretty photos of a certain beautiful book cover, we can get you that book cover, we can get you paper dolls. If you can print them out yourself, you can make a beautiful shot. And so a lot of our efforts were diverted into the direction in which you're still scrolling Instagram. You're probably so bored at home looking at Instagram, we still need to get this book in front of you. Um, likewise, Ashley, if you wanna to speak to some of the cool fan artist stuff that we've been doing too, that was a program that kind of came out of pandemic as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this book was obviously so popular and incredibly popular with artists, which was kind of a surprise for us, a uh, delightful surprise. Um, and we kept seeing all sorts of fan art. There were people that were, you know, drawing Noami and they were drawing her, you know, in that very classic, you know, 1980s Gothic uh, style uh, cover. And so we reached out to a couple of fan artists uh, and actually like commissioned them uh, to make artwork inspired by the book. And then we had them post it on their channels around Halloween to kind of reinforce, reinforce the horror aspects of the uh, of the book. Uh, and it was a, a wonderful success because not only are we hitting, you know, horror readers, but we're actually expanding to people who are maybe a little bit new to horror, maybe haven't tried horror before, um, but this book is kind of their entryway. Um, and I also did want to mention, I mean, Sylvia, you were talking about how some people maybe look down on horror or see it's like a little bit lower tier, um, where it, it's actually interesting because I feel like you are kind of at the forefront of this like wave of like new wave horror of like highbrow, like very serious uh, horror. And uh, I really hope that trend continues because, you know, I think this genre has been, you know, put down a peg for a little bit too long uh, and deserves to be taken a little bit more seriously because there's so much fun uh, in this in this genre. Um, so thank you for making such a breakthrough. Yeah, I mean, what happened historically is that um, there was a huge horror boom in the 1980s. Anybody who remembers that was like the heyday of horror. Uh, I mean, Stephen King came out, but then there came a lot of other people. Uh, we had books like The Elementals, um, and we had things um, like um, Lost Souls by the writer known as Poppy Said Bright in the early 1990s. But then there was a, con a huge contraction, the market kind of collapsed, and the loss of the Abbott's Del Rhine Del line was really the swan song of horror. What happened was that um, bookshelves began to shrink and you couldn't find horror in a bookstore and when you can't find a genre in a bookstore like what has happened to the western for example it it slowly kind of peters out and dies um at least in large commercial spaces so horror continued to exist in smaller independent uh spaces which is where i've been for a really long time consuming some of this and uh there's obviously a horror writers association and fan associations of many different types but as a big commercial entity it it became kind of radioactive so things um that would have been branded as horror in the 1980s were not in most recent times so i'm thinking about station 11 it's a pandemic story and it might have been placed next to the stand Stephen King's The Stand in the 1980s quite easily, but then we kind of separated it now nowadays and we labeled it something else. And this happened also with like certain like uh, serial killer stories and uh, other kind of supernatural things. We call them fantasy. We call them something else in order to differentiate them from those uh, from those categories. And and it was hard. It was really hard to sell horror, you know, as as an agent when you and when you look at publishers uh, weekly and or you see how many sales of so many titles have been bought in that category. It has been traditionally very small for years and years. I do hope that nowadays, um, uh, seeing that we've had books like The Only Good Indians, uh, we've had um, the Southern uh, book to vampire slay <laughs> slaying, uh, which was also pretty, pretty big. Yeah, and some other titles. Um, and especially, yeah, like with, I think I saw what Quirk did with Horror Store and with some of, of these other titles, uh, My Best Friend's Exorcism in the past few years really has helped kind of re revitalize uh, the field. And some of the stuff we're doing is also helping that because they really knew how to market it. They had a really good aesthetic. Um, they sent the writer on a lot of, um, yeah, <laughs> Julie says, yeah. I worked at Quirk on those books. Yeah, yeah. No, it, I think it was very well done. And it really helped kind of bring back uh, horror into 
a commercial space which hadn't been done which hadn't been done in a while and that's why we're seeing some other stuff we're seeing alma katsu also having a, a lot of success with books like the hunger um and the deep and all this kind of work and it's partially because of that because there have been these kind of shifts that have been happening that have been putting it once in the forefront and that haven't been afraid to label it as the big h you know say it's it's a horror novel and other stuff has been happening in other circles on TV and in the movies where horror has also become a category that is not um, like the equivalent of Roger Corman kind, uh, kind of stuff that you, it's kind of secondary direct to video sort of stuff. Like now it's taking center place. And so that's really helping this other stuff that's going on ecologically, I think is helping the category um, a lot, but it, but it's also part of that is uh, some of it is the marketing efforts of, you know, yeah, like what you did with Quirk um, and positioning that and helping kind of people um, not uh, n like understand the possibilities of the genre, because sometimes when people think horror, they only think Stephen King. And although I really like Stephen King, if you don't, then you might think that everything is like him and you will never try anything else, which is kind of like if you only knew about one romance writer and you dismiss the whole field. And meanwhile, it's a very rich field. So part of that is educating people and yeah, doing some of the marketing work of uh, helping consumers understand the variety of it and the possibilities. Yeah, I mean, I can probably speak for hours of sort of just the sheer baggage that the genre terms carry with it. There's so many preconceived notions that sort of carry over just because of the history of a certain genre. And what I've loved about Mexican Gothic, I think this brings us all back to this point, was that it is a very much a chameleon of a title. There were a ton of people who would just, like shelve this accidentally as historical fiction, for instance, because it can mean a lot of different things to different audiences. And one of the things I think is really important for marketers to think about is the message that you're delivering to individual audiences should differ based off of what motivates them to pick up the book. So at Random House, we do a ton of data analytics. Like we do A-B testing just to see like, oh, is it this NPR quote or is it this New York books <laughs> like Times Review that we should be using for this particular audience. And we have, um, you know, an ad promo team that kind of looks at this. We have a data analytics team to sort of give us information about the reader. And, you know, as marketers, our number one job is to make sure your book lands in, with the perfect reader. And that message that we deliver to that reader is going to be that uh, message that makes them be like, oh, I should pay attention to this. And it comes in various forms. It's never really going to be like one ad is going to convince you. It has to be like, layers upon layers like two people said mentioned this one person posted this on Instagram and then finally this like you know friends added it to their Goodreads shelf and you saw it and then maybe that was the thing that convinced you to take a chance on a book and a lot of times it may not be emphasizing the horror it may be emphasizing the fact for my best friend's exorcism we really leaned in on the nostalgia and we leaned in on the like friendship story and so you're you're reading a friendship story yes is there like potential like terrifying extras devil like uh, possessing your friend potentially but at the end of the day it's a story about friendship and that is a universal concept that you could sell to any reader not just one who considers themselves a horror reader yeah and also I think kind of also speaking specifically to this moment one of those kind of like lightning in a bottle things that you can't really replicate but because we were publishing into a pandemic for some reason people were resonating with a story about a woman trapped in a house there was you know that that kind of like theme was hitting and so you know from our messaging I mean we weren't saying like this is a perfect pandemic read but we knew that people were gravitating towards that naturally and we were offering it as a solution to help you escape from the house um and that's something that we were doing kind of across the board uh for for our books, but just like trying to find moments and why people are reading. It's not just what they're reading, but what they're in the mood for. Uh, and again, Mexican Gothic is perfect because it has such a great atmosphere to go along with it as well. Um, so it is it is for the horror reader and, you know, it can be for the historical fiction reader because there is that uh, depth of research that's gone into it. Uh, we see a lot of women's fiction readers uh, gravitating towards this as well, just because, you know, they the main character is so strong. Um, and so again, I think Julie hit the nail on the head. It's a chameleon of a book for sure. Um, and it's just making sure that we have the right message for the right audience. Oh, great. Um, well, I, I'm looking at the clock. Uh, I think we've hit the half hour mark. Do we want to do some questions uh, so we can do the second half as a Q&A portion? 
Excellent. Yeah, we have a lot of great questions. Um, first of all, plenty of people want to know about finding an agent. So, um, Eddie, do you have any advice for somebody seeking representation uh, now or in the foreseeable future? Oh, Eddie, I think you're muted. Right. Okay. So, <laughs> so that is a whole, um, that could be a whole topic of its own, like it, like it, like a whole panel, a whole Q and A, a whole, et cetera. Um, but, uh, I will take a quick look here. Okay. Um, I will start with the question that's in the Q and A, which, um, says, I'm finishing up my book proposal. What could I do from a marketing planning perspective to get the attention of an agent? Give us something unique. Okay, so <laughs> um, I would, if, if there was like some secret sauce, I would, I would be, I wouldn't, I'd be happy to share it or whatever, but there really isn't. I think the main thing here, um, if you're looking at like a marketing planning perspective is gonna be to, um, work on your platform um that's basically like the and platform so not to get too deep into this but um so platform like if you have a nonfiction book about running and you hold um and you hold the world record in the marathon you have a platform to be talking about the subject and that helps um so if there's something if there's something that you have written a nonfiction proposal on and you're on fire to do it and you don't really have a resume for it that the only way to get around that is going to be really great writing and it's a lot tougher um so i would say work on platform um yeah so i'll, uh, I'll stop with that for, for Mexican Gothic, how much was written before you uh, showed the book to Eddie, Sylvia? And uh, what was the timeline like from there uh, before you started working with the publishers? Uh, well, the book that we sold first to Del Rey was Gods of Jade and Shadow. So that was the book that was, that was complete and that went out. Um, Mexican Gothic happened when I already had a contract with Del Rey. So it was a little bit different. But if we want to talk about Gods of Jade and Shadow, it was a complete manuscript. Um, and, uh, that's been the case for basically all, all of my books, because I have bounced around between many different companies, both bigger and smaller. So I often read, I haven't written proposals really. I have, I've finished a book and then I have handed it to Eddie and I've said, and, and I have said something ahead of time, like uh, heads up, there's a Western coming down that you're going to have to try to sell in six months or so. But, um, but yeah, so in that sense, um, then how long did Mexican Gothic take uh, to write from that point on? I, I don't remember how many months it took it took until I delivered. But when I delivered, again, it was a full manuscript, so it was a it was um, it wasn't like Eddie had seen it before and then he did some edits and then it went out to mm -hmm. Trisha, which would be which is not an abnormal process with yeah. agents normally yeah, and that was more yeah. that was the case with gods of jade and shadow yeah um, that was the case with gods of jade and shadow more like uh and and signal to noise maybe where you would mm -hmm. be sign on with an uh most people sign on with an agent the agent looks at the manuscript and they say um especially if they've had some kind of editorial training which eddie has had they like to polish it and work on it with the writer and then it'll go out to the publishing companies of the of the world, so uh, so yeah, that has been more or less my process almost every yeah quite frequently, as opposed to other people who I've heard uh, they write on proposals. So I have a friend who got a two book deal just like I did with Del Rey. Uh, her book is coming out in 2021. And her second book was also like, and for an untitled book, whatever it is in the future. And right now she's working on, as she told me, she's gotten done like three pages of, a, um, I guess, a proposal. She, you know, she's explaining what her story is going to be like. It's probably going to be more like five pages in the end. And so she's having these discussions with her editor at this point in time where they want like a whole like outline of uh, what's the next book going to be and 
and her agent is also involved with that. And so they're having these conversations right now. So she hasn't written anything um, yet, whereas I'm much more of a person where I just kind of have these less formal chats. And then uh, because I'm pretty fast and I don't like to do outlines, it's just like suddenly there's a book in your inbox one Monday for some reason, because I stayed up and I worked for, you know, days without sleeping. And I wrote something and I say, what does, do you think you like this? Um, and they'll say like, oh yeah. And I'm like, okay, like, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll rewrite it later. Um, that kind of thing. But, but sometimes with some editors, they do want that kind of three, four pages, explain what your next book is going to be, or you're selling on proposal, especially for series book, you know, four books. And so uh, you might deliver the first one, but they also want to know what's going to happen in books two, three, and four. And so that's more of a thing where you might write a proposal and your agent and your editor might be involved. Um, yeah. So there's different ways that, um, that this happens in the business. There's no kind of one size fits all and nonfiction books are especially done by proposal. So mm -hmm. I know people who are working on memoirs where they first wrote the proposal and they said, this is what I'm going to write about but they haven't finished the the memoir and um and nonfiction can also take a lot more time if you need to do research go look at archives so in those cases you normally sell on proposal whereas with fiction you normally especially if you're a first time author starting off the gate you finish the full manuscript and then you kind of show it to the agent the agent revises and then you find a home for it a lot of us are intrigued by your involvement with the cover. Um, is that something that you negotiated into the contract of veto power or to input? a certain degree? It's not it's not approval, I don't think, but I think it was um, I think what we uh, agreed to is meaningful consultation, which means um, that the, the publisher is definitely going to be consulting with the author throughout the process. And that. Um, well, uh, just just in general, I like with 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 clients to try to give them as much say in the cover process as possible, and um, then just also having seen this a couple times firsthand, I know by by the time we were you know looking at the contract for Gods of Jade and Shadow and Mexican Gothic, I had learned from experience that you need to make sure. Um, that if, well, I don't know. Okay, more bluntly, um, if it, it, it's, it's particularly important with authors of color to have meaningful consultation because there are things that um, our departments, now they're, they're getting better about it, but they've historically missed. Like I remember, not, not with Sylvia, but with another, um, another cover where, you know, it was kind of whitewashed and we had to go back to the publisher and, and you know, sort that out. Um, anyway, so that was, <laughs> that was kind of in the back of my mind when we were um, sorting out uh, exactly what the consultation language would look like, but then, you know, as things have progressed, instead of it being rooted in, in these sort of fears, it's been more um, Sylvia's background and um, facility for art direction have been allowed to shine throughout the process, and that's really shown itself in, um, in the covers for these books. Yeah, and I should say that there's always variation in the co in the cover um, capabilities of an editorial. Mm -hmm. A small independent press will have, you know, less money uh, to work on a cover, and they may have to rely on stock art. Stock art ha is traditionally really quite white. You find it hard to f to find certain ethnicities. So you yeah. might, if you're looking for a a girl in a ball gown, you can find a lot of white blonde girls in ball gowns, but not so many black girls in ball gowns. So what do you do if you have a, uh, you know, a beautiful black woman in a ball gown? Um, so, so yeah, smaller presses may have restrictions that um, a presses with a little bit uh, more resources uh, might not. And it also depends on the importance of your title and all these, all these kinds of things. Um, but we have, uh, 
tried, well, I've tried, I always talk about things a little bit candidly, and I'll always try to uh, kind of talk about the things that I do know about and not mess with the things that I don't know about. So I know some stuff about art direction. I, I have some background in certain arenas where I can understand certain factors. And then there's other things where I really don't want to be involved. I don't care uh, if you put a varnish on the letters or not. That's getting a little bit nitty gritty for me. I don't really mind the weight of the paper, although I know about paper weights, but I think, you know, that's fine. And, um, and you know, if it's a, I also understand that um, if it's a foreign edition, I'm not going to have the same kind of input that I would have with, with the Del Rey team if it's going to be reprinted in Brazil or whatever. They'll have their own aesthetic um, and their own, their own needs. But I do try to bring what I can to the process without uh, making it more difficult for people to do their jobs, basically. Um, someone asked, uh, how are writers of color bringing new energy and insight into the horror genre? Uh, another person asked, is it easier now than it was five years ago uh, for a, a Latinx author um, to get published? And uh, should being Latinx or BIPOC be mentioned in a query letter? So thoughts on any of that? I think I, I mean, I've been around, I've been writing since 2006 and this is my sixth novel. So I've been around for a while and I do remember the days when um, you didn't have any black people on book covers for science fiction and fantasy books uh, when you didn't couldn't recognize more than one Asian writer uh, who was writing fantasy or science fiction and nowadays you have several so it is improving and I think it's becoming more diverse on a number of of axes um, but when you add it up it still represents a small percentage of the total kind of universe that that is happening um, so although we have some names that are more recognizable and are getting attention, if you put them overall, it's still uh, not representative of, for example, the U.S. population, which is a very diverse population. Um, and so there's a lot of work to do, but I would say that people entering the field right now are having a much better um, space than you might have had 15 years ago when I started writing, uh, certainly. And um, and about mentioning, um, yeah, I guess your background in a cover letter. I, I mean, I can talk about that a little bit more, but I always think it's like if it's relevant to the work that you're producing, you should definitely mm -hmm. mention it in your cover letter. So if you are a young Latina, a young Puerto Rican woman writing a book about a a young uh, Puerto Rican girl growing up in 1980s New York that is insider specialized knowledge. And if you were an archaeologist and you wrote a book that is uh, like an Indiana Jones archaeological fantasy, I would want to know about that because it means you have special knowledge. And the same thing goes for any kind of background where you can provide, uh, you know, some specific and specialized context. Well, the book's been very successful. Uh, what would y'all say are the, the most successful events or promotions or other campaign components that uh, that you enjoyed this year? So marketing to take that first? I would, I mean, I would say sure. the paper dolls in particular, Sylvia's idea to sort of produce those really, really um, went over well, not only because the projects themselves was like, the products themselves was so good, but the artists actually became a huge fan in her own right and actually started creating more art. And her art got retweeted like hundreds of times, thousands of times, actually do you remember? Thousands, that? yeah, it was something like 3000. It went like moderately viral uh, within the first 24 hours. And we actually talked with our social analytics team and they were able to plot a point on the social conversation. And there's a huge spike when she posted that, um, which is just a lovely little byproduct that we couldn't have predicted. Um, I was going to say we also partnered with a, uh, a Latino-owned uh, vintage makeup company, uh, Bisme, 
uh, and we partnered with them to make uh, their uh, Wild Orchid lipstick, which is based on a palette from 1952. Uh, and we had that the official look of Mexican Gothic. Uh, and we did some sweet stakes and some social promotions and uh, some makeup contests around that as well. And that was just like a really fun uh, thing for me. I'm wearing the lipstick now. I don't know if you can tell from your screens, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, that was, that was really fun because again, it was, you know, finding that audience in a different space that we wouldn't normally, but it was also such a natural fit for this book uh, and everything going on in it. And we had, we had a ton of fun with that. I mean, overall, like what ties it all together is we spent a lot of work sort of looking for the book's natural champions early on, like making sure that we were finding the right partners, we're finding the right people who will be able to move the needle for us, and then making sure they knew about this book. And the minute they read it, we knew that they would love it. And that's oftentimes like Sylvia made our job so much easier because we knew that the minute we gave them this book, they were going to fall in love with it. But we just wanted to make sure we got it in the right hands so that when they fell in love with it, the first thing that they wanted to do would be to talk about it, to create with it, to you know assign lipstick colors to it. And, um, and that is sort of how you create that organic buzz that's extremely hard to replicate um, if you don't have a book that in of itself is a good read. Um, there's been a lot of talk about what's expected of an author uh, for marketing these days. Um, what would y'all say is, you know, your, your real expectation for the author's involvement uh, these days? I think it honestly varies to the author's comfort level. Like, I think it's important for the authors to be authentic. I wouldn't want to make someone go on Instagram or go on Twitter if they don't feel naturally fit, like they have something to say. I think there is often pressure to build the personal brand as it were and like to show off the fact that you have a ton of followers and on a surface level yes it can be you know um good like it's great that someone has millions of followers but at the end of the day it could be that the engagement on those followers are going to be very low and i think the most important things that authors can really do from the marketing perspective is to stay authentic on the channels that they feel most comfortable most thorough in and you know continue to work on what they want to work on but at the end of the day, the most important thing is to write a good story. A good story, a good book is not gonna, like it's, having a giant Twitter following cannot replace the fact that your book has to land really well. Um, so hopefully, uh, Sylvia, I don't know if you have any more thoughts to sort of that yeah, respect as well. No, yeah, I'm, I'm on Twitter, uh, which is I'm most active. I have a Facebook page, but it has less fans. So that's where I'm most active. And I actually like Twitter, so that's why I'm there. I retweet a lot of stuff regularly and uh, tweet about random things that interest me, but I don't do it um, necessarily because I'm hoping that somebody will buy my book, although I do talk about my book and, you know, review the book and that kind of stuff regularly, but it's intersped with all these other things that I that I like to do. I just find Twitter... Uh, well, now that now when I would COVID, it's a little bit different. But before, I, it would be that I would be working and I would take a little, you know, break, uh, stretch, you know, my limbs or whatever from the computer, and I would, you know, look at the phone and find something interesting. And so it was this thing to do during the day that would like or in line while I was waiting for coffee. Um, so it's just this easy kind of thing that I liked um, to do. But I wouldn't recommend that somebody um, like I know there's people who really love Instagram because they love. Uh, putting pictures together and doing this kind of curating of of their objects and they and they love it and but if somebody hated that I wouldn't tell them you know go and do it so I don't have an Instagram uh, because I don't really do that stuff very very much um, and then that's the reason so I think if you really don't like it yeah it'll it'll weigh on you it'll become a huge chore as opposed to something that you you know enjoy doing or, or really you know don't you're like yeah okay I'll do it and consumers are pretty savvy to authenticity these days. They know when they're being sold to and they know when you're not having fun on a platform. Um, so just kind of expanding on that as well. Yeah, I think if there's a, a platform that's not resonating with you and that you don't enjoy, then again, there is there is no need. Uh, we want it to be authentic uh, to you and from your voice. Uh, and we want you know readers to feel like they're connecting with you and they're never gonna do that if you're just like, okay, here's my book. It's on sale on this date. And that's all you post, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, let's say if, if an author is indie published or with a small press with a small marketing budget, are there are there certain avenues that you'd recommend or uh, like specific platforms even or any other tips you might have? 
Yeah, I would say these days um, with a lot of uh, major platforms becoming self-serve advertising, you can do a lot and you can learn a lot with a very small budget. So for instance, like Facebook is self-serve, Reddit is self-serve. I think even Goodreads might've been testing some self-serve at some point, though I don't know if that tool is um, fully launched yet, but you know, even with a modest budget, you can take a lot of learnings and test out messaging, test out, you know, even sending out early reviews um, through NetGalley or through Goodreads, having people give you feedback and then making sure like what is working, what's not working, and then only, you know, pushing towards what works. And I think these days more so than in years previous where, you know, that New York Times banner ad may or may not get you any kind of learning. You can actually do a lot of different creatives and a lot of different messaging to kind of make as much bang with your $2,000 budget as you can. Uh, Eddie, there's a question for you. Um, someone says she heard, Erica Wirth says she heard uh, that anyone who's published with smaller presses could be at a disadvantage uh, when approaching a larger press. Is that something you find true? Uh, not really. Okay, so uh, I've scrolled up to the, the text of the um, questions so that I can kind of lean into it. Um, so anyone who had published it, yeah, so, so someone had made a claim that anyone who published with smaller presses would not inherently be at a disadvantage. That I disagree with. Um, it it's a it's too it's just too simplistic um first first of all um like if you have like like i can kind of see where they might have come from with that because if somebody has had a few books with smaller presses and kind of have a sales history um with barnes and noble or whatever at this you know at this level that makes it a little harder to sell into but at the same time um if you're looking at if you're looking at um you know breaking into um a larger house and and getting you know a, a bigger a bigger support system um that you can all you can also just kind of turn around and speak to that narrative um as an agent as a as a publisher is somebody working in marketing so um if and then you know do big presses look down on writers who've published with smaller even if their books have been relatively successful no um especially not if books have been relatively successful so if you know if somebody has had a book with um like melville house well I, they're they're getting bigger but um with like melville house that sold you know that's done pretty well um that clearly had probably earned back its five thousand dollar advance or whatever um yeah it's not going to count against you um that's the, that's the short answer um and there there can be yeah no i i think that i think there can sometimes be a tendency to give um sort of high-handed advice or to summarize things really succinctly and there there are just so many different like paths that I don't think that works. All right, well, turning back to the book, someone asks, uh, Sylvia, what did you do in terms of research? Did you travel to El Triunfo? Um, and also, was there a special marketing campaign for Mexico? I know you live in Canada, so this is sort of an international campaign. Uh, yeah, El Triunfo is a fake town, but it's directly based on a real town, which is called Real del Monte. And so, yes, I've been to Real del Monte. Um, if you look at my Twitter feed, I've uh, shown pictures of it and or you can just google it Real del Monte or Mineral del Monte uh, it's called uh, Little Cornwall uh, it's what you know in, in it's the nickname that people have given it in Mexico so it is a real town and there's a real English cemetery and when I went to it which was many years ago it wasn't being advertised as a tourist destination so back then everything was kind of like you know more laid back and you had to find it on your own nowadays it's been designated a pueblo magico a magical town so it's part of a tourism campaign so you can go there and, um, and there's more stuff there's like brochures and things like that uh, that you can that you can look at and it's a whole mining region so you that's a pretty small town but there's a bigger city nearby pachuca and they also have a lot of mining uh, kind of stuff. So it is real. And as to marketing, um, to 
I guess, Mexican American audiences or um, Latino audiences in the United States. We, I did have at one point, I did mention, and marketing would, more, would know more about this. I asked them to make sure that we had the book sent to some reviewers that would, un, that would have that same kind of ethnic background uh, so that they could read it. I did ask if they could send it to some writers who were also of uh, Mexican American or kind of Latin American extraction so they could look at it for potential blurbs. And I also asked them if during uh, Hispanic Heritage Month, which runs, which is a weird one because it starts like September 15, it's kind of starts mid month and bleeds into October. So it leads into Halloween. If they could make sure that um, bookstores that had that served that audience, you know, got a reminder and maybe some materials for, for promotion around that time because they might not have been aware. So I, I do believe the marketing team did some of that work. And of course, some of this stuff was also things like um, like the makeup, um, the lipstick promotion. That company is owned by a South American makeup artist who has her own company. So they were specifically, Ashley was specifically and, and Julie were looking for a makeup company that not only created vintage cosmetics, but that also had a cultural connection and they found it. So, you know, although you might think, what are the odds um, <laughs> they did, but maybe they can talk a bit about how um, some of those uh, marketing efforts that happened during Hispanic Heritage Month and uh, kind of two specialized stores took place. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say this has been a, a project from Gods of Jade and Shadow. It's like tapping in again to the book's natural champions. Who's going to fall in love with the book and who's going to be the person that's going to be so excited to talk about it? And I think there's a great movement amongst like people of color and publishing and we need diverse books. And so early on, we when we could mail things, I would send out early copies of Gods of Jade and Shadow to those mailing lists to make sure that they knew at least about Sylvia. And then so that when Mexican Gothic was coming around, they already kind of knew her from a previous book. And also the fact that Mexican Gothic did sort of have these natural promotional angles like um, Hispanic Heritage Month was like right after the summer blitz that we had when the book first came on sale, followed closely by Halloween, followed closely by the Goodreads Choice Awards. We always had something new to talk about. And so not only marketing, but publicity was able to go back to contacts over and over again, each time with better and bigger news to kind of create this um, big buzz. But, you know, one of the things I'm very, very cognizant of in terms of marketing is that I never want sort of the um, Latinx or the sort of BIPOC um, designation to silo a book. And so the goal is to always, you know, lean in on it where the book is going to be championed by members of the community. But the end goal is that everyone should be picking up Mexican Gothic and loving this book and regardless of their background. And so that was already kind of in our mind. It's a tool, it's a bonus, it's a wonderful layer to have to contextualize it. But at the end of the day, a book like Mexican Gothic should be read by everyone. And that's always been our marketing approach in terms of any um, like author who, who comes with a diverse background. And I did mention uh, when we were putting together the um, kind of like the marketing plan that I sp speak Spanish fluently and that I would be willing to be interviewed by Spanish language outlets. I don't think anybody really took us up on the offer, but we they did try, you know, so they put it in, you know, in some materials like she's available to speak in Spanish, but that is something that, you know, if um, if you speak another language, for example, or, or if you're involved with another community intimately, you would want to let the people who are doing your publicity and your marketing know ahead of time because that's an advantage. So if you're an indigenous person and you're very much involved with the indigenous community in Winnipeg, uh, there may be some opportunities to do some stuff already there that are already built in as opposed to them building something from scratch. Um, someone asked, uh, how does an author not being in the United States play into the amount of their advance and the support, the support that the book gets if uh, they're not able to do a book tour when that's possible. Is that an issue? Well, the good news is that almost nobody gets book tours. So <laughs> we are in a very equal playing field. I, th I think people um, are used to thinking that book tours are a lot more common than they are. I've, I actually know very few people who um, get really large book tours and they generally turn turn to be very big names like uh, Del Rey did fly me in for example for um, a comic-con that was 
kind of closer to to where I live in the United States. So not in Canada, but you know, I, I flew um, I flew a couple of hours somewhere else, and they fly me in there. I've also done things on my own. So like I said, on my own dime, I was in California, and that was um, I I try to bundle opportunities together. So when I'm traveling somewhere and I'm paying it out of pocket, I will usually tell ahead of time the marketing team and Eddie, I'm going to be in New York because I'm going to be doing X kind of thing. Uh, can you also book me like a book signing or something like that? And, and they generally kind of try to do uh, some of this stuff. So even if um, a company won't give you your own book tour, there's probably some stuff that you can do in your local community. I've signed books also for independent bookstores where I've just showed up and I said, that's me in the window. Would you like me to sign some stock? Um, and you know, now they know me, some of them, um, or also when I've been driving around for some reason in another area, I've sometimes stopped at a, you know, at a bookstore and said, Hey, that's me. I'll, I'll sign that for you. Um, so there's things you can create kind of opportunities for, for yourself, but I don't think I, you know, book tours uh, can be very good and they can be very bad because sometimes you do something and only one person shows up. And so I don't think it's worth spending all of your money on this kind of stuff on, on, on your own or get really upset if you don't have one, it's not, an indication that your book is not good or anything like that. I mean, by and large, book tours, you have to really think about reach with like the mm -hmm. money that you spend to fly there, to sort of spend time there. Can that money reach more people through a digital ad? Can that reach people through an um, influencer campaign? Um, a lot of times we think about in terms of like, you know, how effective is sort of the book tour and more and more we're seeing, especially now in this landscape, it's hard. It's hard to get people physically in a store, especially um, for build authors and midlist authors to command and it may not necessarily be worth their time. Um, I will say too, just the Canadian thing brought me up. I think the biggest thing was sending you thousands of book plates so we had to sign over a matter of a week to get yeah. back to me in Connecticut so that I can send it out to places. Um, that was like, honestly, customs was the only really, um, trip up in terms of getting physical things back and forth. But I'm so glad for those book plates actually, because um, when we were talking about the Latinx Heritage Month, we also did sort of a round of mailings to um, Latinx owned bookstores and those who really supported Mexican Gothic on an inventory level and were able to sort of give them signed copies to sell in a landscape in which it was really hard to get signed copies in the middle of June when authors couldn't go anywhere to sign books. So that was, again, Fun fact about Canadian customs, the package was beat to hell. <laughs> it looked like it had been through like a grinder, but all the book books came. Um, and it was really, really nice to be able to still do that level of promotion, especially for independent bookstores who are struggling right now, um, to give them something to set, elevate their product a little bit over what they could potentially get on a larger retailer. Yeah. Um, someone asked uh, for a cross genre book, how do you figure out where your time is? time and money are best spent um and just how do you divide up the marketing budget in general is that something you know going in that's a really good question um i think so budget marketing kind of happens in two phases there is the marketing that we do that is industry focused so pre-pub a lot of what ashley and i do is actually getting our sales team jazzed up about this book getting the independent booksellers excited about this book so we would spend a part of budget just marketing to industry. But then right at um, on sale, we sort of get a good sense of, oh, do the buzz build up? Are people excited? Then that's when we sort of um, do the majority ad spend. And that is when we're kind of building on what we've already created, the snowball effect of uh, you know the buzz from the booksellers, the buzz from the, new, the early reviewers who've already left Goodreads reviews based off of free copy on NetGalley. Like um, that is, I would say the majority spend is to like build on what we built early on. So that's kind of how we look at the budget in terms of how we look at it from a genre perspective. I think one of the things that um, working at Del Rey and working on, on, you know, it seems like we do a lot of science fiction fantasy and it is kind of encapsulated into this one book. But if you look at the books that we work on, they cross genres all the time to the point where a lot of people don't realize they're reading a fantasy novel, wouldn't necessarily think of themselves as like a fantasy reader. And one of the things that I think in terms of marketing that as we're changing the way we think about a book, it's not really a product, it's more about the experience and the mood. We're not selling you, you know, you read Station Eleven, surely you must like this other book because you read Station Eleven. 
it's what are you in the mood to read right now? What are sort of the inner motivators that um, convince you to buy a book? Like I could see someone looking at my Sin Gothic, hearing the buzz about it and thinking, I want to be that person who's in the know. I want to be the person who can tell my girlfriends that I read the hottest book and they should, you know, also, talk, you know, read this book. And it's activating that in somebody as opposed to like activating them from a comp title or comp author sort of um, approach. Because I love science fiction fantasy novels, but sometimes I'm not in the mood to read a science fiction fantasy novel. I want to read a nonfiction. What is that motivator to get me to pick a certain nonfiction book? And that's, I think, where the marketing juju really lies is um, encapsulating the mood and experience. And so I think if you're looking at cross genre, that's kind of how you want to look at it. It's not genre, there's no borders to be crossed. It's really what is that experience and mood you want a reader to walk away with. I hope that was helpful. That's great. Well, this has been lovely. I think we can wrap up in a, in a few uh, minutes, but we'd like some final parting advice from each of you. Um, if, you any, if you have any predictions for market trends in the next year, um, sales in certain categories going up or down, uh, changes in marketing strategy, I, know it's, uh, I mean, we're in a weird place I, with the vaccine and all that. But. Yeah, it's a it's a big question, but I do think it's interesting that, you know, everyone is talking about this year and how much of an impact it's made and people are excited about a vaccine and going back to normal. But I don't think we're going to go back to normal completely. I think there have been some changes that have occurred over this past year that are going to be permanent. Um, I think focus on digital is going to be uh, even more important moving forward, especially digital events. I think, especially when we're talking about book tours, uh, think about how more, much more accessible we've made events with authors uh, to readers. You know, I think that's something that I could definitely see continuing into the future. Um, so again, thinking about the new year, it's like, yes, the vaccine's coming, but also let's take some lessons from this time as well. That sounds great. Uh, Sylvia, do you have any final advice for writers who are maybe polishing a manuscript now and preparing to send? Um, yes, I think people sometimes focus too much on the first manuscript and they think it's going to be the only thing that's going to break or make them. But my, I have a lot of unfinished novels and also the first novel that I shopped around never sold. Um, and uh, so it's not a death sentence if, you know, the first book right off the gate doesn't work out. There might, it might be one, two, three books later that you actually um, get, get an agent so not to get kind of desperate because there's always that kind of thing where you fear you're aging out of a category. And so, um, you know, I will self-publish it myself. And I, and I do have a very small kind of editorial where I have published some uh, bizarre and interesting things from other people too, not just mine. But it is a very different thing when you are kind of selling books um, than just writing them. It takes a lot of brain power and effort and money. So it's not the easy solution that some people might, might think it is. So just to, um, uh, yeah, not get desperate, know that sometimes, it's not the first two, three, four queries that seem to work, but dozens of queries after. I have friends who have spent a long time and they finally did sell a manuscript um, and they're you know, going to have their debuts next year, that kind of stuff. I guess the um, other thing is that I would caution people to start getting in a professional writing mode right away. And what I mean by that is uh, think about things like saving your receipts now and how you're going to organize that and putting away money for your taxes and that nitty gritty little thing. Even if you haven't published a book, um, at least in Canada, I think it's the same in the USA. If you're serious, like if you're serious about publishing, you can claim that in your tax return. So you can claim uh, things like the ink that you're spending and the books that you're doing for research and you should be uh, you should start getting into good habits now rather than later because it'll be a lot later when you have a shoebox full of receipts I know what that is like so don't do that 
Um, and there's a lot of good apps that you can use nowadays that will help you to keep yourself organized. Another one about good habits, I think it's useful to, very useful, and especially if you're a woman, because your time is often minimized and you have, and you are expected to do most house chores and things like that, is to designate a certain portion of your day as your writing time. And it doesn't have to be a huge portion. It can be half an hour where you tell everybody in your family from uh, 9 to 9.30, this is mommy's writing time. So she's going to be busy on the computer. And actually, small children are very good about it. And it's the grownups who are much harder to convince that why won't you watch this funny YouTube video with me. But it's part about people taking seriously your aspirations as a writer and giving your space. It's not just a room of one's own. It's kind of like this mental space of one's own. And even if you don't have a specific writing room, you can still like put on your headphones. Like I didn't have an office for many years for 12 out of my, of my 15 years writing. I haven't had an office um, and I just wrote on the couch or whatever, but it was headphones on. Sylvia's not around, has turned invisible, pretend she's not here. And just making that something official and designating like half an hour for that time, I think just helps you. Other people understand that your time is valuable and you don't necessarily have to do writing during that time. You can do reading, you can do journaling, you can do researching, you can do ancillary writing related tasks such as organizing your receipts, uh, but it is your time. And uh, I think setting that aside will really help you just, you know, think I'm a writer and I'm serious about my writing as opposed to this is just something that mommy does for fun and like don't don't belittle yourself other people will belittle you for free so um, it's okay to think that you're uh, serious about that um, yeah and, and I guess that's it and I mean the one other thing about Writing that is fun is just finding a writing community that you enjoy. And uh, I'm not very sociable, but I do know some people who I like to talk about books and hang out with. And even though not everybody needs to have an MFA, um, there's lots of places where you can hang out online, uh, chats like this or other places where you can just share uh, kind of the ups and downs of writing uh, so that it's a little bit easier as opposed to feeling that you're completely isolated especially if you're a person of color, uh, I think finding those communities and they often have good advice and resources is key. So I'm a member of um, Crime Writers of Color. So that's one. And I'm sure there's other places where you can find communities like that. I'm not very active nowadays, but sometimes I check the message board and it can be fun just to, you know, do it for a minute or two and see what everybody is up to. So yeah, that's a lot of stuff, but take what works for you and uh, forget about the rest that's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. And I love that about the tax receipts. The Authors Guild were pretty obsessed with nitty gritty business and legal details. <laughs> That's up our alley. Well, Sylvia, thank you so much for writing the book. It's lovely. And thanks to Eddie, Julie, and Ashley for shepherding it to us. And thank you all so, so much for being here and sharing your knowledge with us. We really appreciate it. Thank you for having us. Thanks for having and us. Thanks to everyone for watching us. Thank you. Good night. Right, take care. Happy holidays. Happy New Year. Good night. Happy holidays.